Oh, are we? Yeah. Uh -huh. we'll, we'll, we'll just let the exchange take place. Uh. Well, it's been a good morning so far. It really has, you know. There's been... Um, you know, the first service came, it was great worship, gathered around the Word, people fellowshiped, people praying for each other, encouraging one another. It was, uh, and here we are, ready to do it again. And uh, that's glorious. So, um, open your Bibles with me, if you will. We're continuing in the book of Romans. And uh, let me have a sip. I feel like I'm... Am I, am I echoey to you guys? Sounds echoey to me from where I am. Oh. Okay. Um, let's pray. And Father, we thank you. We do praise you. And um, <laughs> as we do every, every time we come into your presence, Lord, we, um, we just thank you that you are our Heavenly Father. You've called us to be your children. That you've called us into that relationship of intimacy and fellowship. And that you've called us sons and daughters. and You've given us your word. You've given us prayer. You've given us your presence in our lives. You've given us that wonderful, wonderful gospel message that works in us and through us to touch this world around us. You've given us purpose for being. And I just thank you, Father, that in this room, um, this morning, you would just continue to minister, continue that work of transformation, changing us by the power of your spirit through your word from glory to glory into the image of Christ, Father. Remind us again this morning of what happened on Calvary's mountain. How you shed your blood to cleanse us, how you were lifted up, your body was lifted up to draw us unto yourself, that the power of your love would capture our hearts and the wonder of your grace, Lord, would bring faith to our hearts to call upon your name for the forgiveness of sins, that we might know that we are saved. Father, thank you for this. Praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning, Chris. Um, uh, this morning, Romans 13. Are you there? Did I tell you that? Romans 13. We are essentially finishing off last week's message, which, as I said in the first service, is bids well for you guys, um, which means I won't keep you here forever. Um, but, again, we'll see what happens. <laughs> How amazing it would be if the Lord would come back while we're in this service. You know? Think about that. How amazing that would be. I would have your attention for the rest of your earthly existence. <laughs> it's not all about me. No. This is what we considered last week. God loves us. Remember? God loves us. Every day, he is devoted to our well-being. Every day, we experience his grace and his mercy. Every day. Every day. The, the wonder of his presence within our lives, reminding us who we belong to, that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Every day drawn towards him, but at the same time being led by him, realising that in him all things are possible. Yes. You know, nothing's beyond our God. Right. Every day, God's showing us. Every day, in tangible, real ways, we're reminded that God is with us. It's his love. It's his grace. It's his mercy. Through the good and the bad. 
through the sometimes hard to understand times, through the crucible that is often life, you know, God is always, always there. And we know it, don't we? We know it, we experience it, and we know, this is the other thing, we know that we have done nothing that warrants us deserving this grace, this love, this mercy, nothing at all. But because he loves us, we daily continue to receive this grace, this mercy, this love. And so the question was, this was the question last week, in light of that knowing, how then can we not recognise the love or the debt of love that we owe? And being debtors to such a great love, how can we not in the same way love ourselves? I said that wrong, that was bad grammar. But how can we not in the same way love others? How can we not extend grace and mercy and love to each other? How can we, how can we not, knowing that, that we are debtors to love, debtors to the love of the heart of the creator of heaven and earth? Verse 9, you'll remember, concluded, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to your neighbour. Therefore, love is the fulfilment of the law. So love is seeking. This is what we're looking at. Love is seeking the very best interest for whoever. That's who our neighbour is, right? That's what Jesus taught us in the, um, the Good Samaritan. Our neighbour is whoever God places in our path. And so again, so again as we said every, last week, every time... Let there be an eternal dialogue going on. Every time we are brought into the presence of another human being, let there be this internal dialogue that is speaking. I need to show this person the love of Christ, for I have such a great and wonderful debt to pay. That's what Paul's saying here. And let that dialogue be the very motivation by the knowing that we don't have a lot of time to pay it. Now, this life is fleeting, yes. right? So these are the verses we read last week. And do this knowing the time. Do this, what? Continue in this love. Do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armour of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but let us put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfil its lusts. Paul was saying, we live in love knowing. And again, from last week, knowing is referring to this intuitive knowledge that is born in the heart of a child of God. He's given the believer, this is us, he's given the believer a spiritual sensitivity to the shortness of this present life as compared to the, to the eternal life that is before us. It's all about time. It's all about time and knowing that we don't have much left. This intuitive knowledge. It should be the very thing that spurs us on to redeem, to redeem every moment in the expression of this great love. To redeem every moment in the expression of this great love. Again, as we said last week, who wants to waste this precious time on unforgiveness and hatred? and deception and deceit and warring and struggling. Who wants to waste it? And we've got this incredible love, the power of God's forgiveness to change a life forever. Time is the essence. Time is the essence. This intuitive knowledge. Paul um, ex expected, he was aware of this, he expected the second coming of Jesus. He knew the time was short. 
all of the New Testament writers, the early church, expected at any moment that Christ was returning and there was a great urgency in the way that they lived. Again, time is the essence. Paul wrote to the Christians saying that the, the hour has come for us to wake up to the reality of this. Again, Peter himself said the, the end of all things is at hand. He understood this, right? James said, you know, be patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draws near, he said. John would say, little children, it is the last hour. And Jesus himself said, just before he ascended into heaven, he said, I am coming. How? I'm coming quickly. Right? You see, this is the thing. 2,000 years ago, eternity invaded time and in so doing placed time within our hearts. What do I mean by that? Jesus Christ, God himself, entered into time, this realm where we live, and through his perfect sacrifice, the condition of man's sin and self-willed rebellion to God was provided for. Now, man, every single one of us in this room, we can call upon the name of the Lord. We can ask for his forgiveness. We can call upon him and ask him to be our Lord. We can follow him and we can be saved. Every one of us in this room. You can just call upon the Lord. The provision is there for you. It's been made. And we can have the absolute assurance of eternal life. Jesus has completed the work of redemption. He's completed the work of redemption. He has entered back into the presence of the Father. He sent the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God for the last 2,000 years has been gathering in the family of God. And it's almost done. It's almost finished. All we're waiting for, all we're waiting for, is for that last member of the eternal family of God to say, yes, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Lord, I love you. I thank you, Father. Be my God. That's all we're waiting for. And that will trigger something so incredible, so magnificent. The return of our King. That person could be sitting in this room. You could be holding the show up. You realise that? No. Here's the thing. Jesus is the completion of all things. And there's only one thing left. Yes, that last person will cry out for forgiveness. That last person will become a child of God. And in that instant, Jesus will return to establish the kingdom of God. Therefore, all of the writers in the New Testament, all of them are saying that it's time. It's always time. It's always imminent. Again, the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians said, Now these things happen upon them for our example. He's talking about all of the Old Testament believers. Everything that happened in the history of God's, God's people. The great plan of God. Everything that was unfolding throughout the plan of God. It was all written for who? For our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. That's us. That's us. Therefore, you and I are constantly living in the shadow of eternity. The return of Jesus Christ is hanging over all of us. It's always time. You know that? It's always time. And that's how we should be living. Time is short. People are being swept into eternity without a hope of salvation. So God wants his people to get it together. I think that's what I said to you last week. He wants his people to get it together. We're, you know, but here's the thing. He wants us to know that every moment has eternal consequences for someone, for somebody. He wants us to know that that, that, that everything, that, that, that every moment, that every, that every event that has eternal consequences for someone is connected to the ethic of love that is completely directed from the child of God to the heart of an unbeliever. You know? So what we read now is simply a call, not simply a call just for believers to get it together. Well, it is. But we've got to understand we're not just being implored to focus on our own spirituality 
because we know that the Lord is coming. That shouldn't be the only motivation, but rather we are being motivated towards godliness for the sake of those who are not ready. You see, we're so selfish, aren't we? We even think that these, these, these scriptures that talk about being ready for the return of the Lord is just, just so we don't miss out. No, no, no. You are being implored, implored to readiness for the sake of those that are not ready. For you to be the, the, light of, the light of the world. For you to be the salt of the earth. For you to be the ones that are shining the reality of the power of the gospel to those around us that are in darkness. That, that's why we need to be ready. We've got to understand that. We've got to know that. This motivation to holiness that Paul is talking about here is for the sake of the lost. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. You know, there was a time in life, do you remember it? When, when we suddenly realise, it's not about me. Everything I go through, all my experiences, it's not about me. You know, I mean, you've heard me say this a thousand times. You've heard me say this a lot of times. If, if, if God saved me 30 years ago and just left me here to endure until he comes with no purpose, then what? No, no, no. God saved me 30 years ago and has given me 30 years of time, of precious time. Years to be conformed to the image of Christ, but to be a light unto this world, to impact every person that comes along my path, to be ministering into their life, to be shining the, the, the reality of Christ from my life to their life, that some might believe there's purpose to every moment, there's purpose to every time. That's why we are here. So can you read these verses with me again? So there's our backdrop. Let's read these verses again. And do this. What I've just spent 15 minutes talking about. Do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armour of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and in drunkenness, not in lewdness, not in lust, not in strife, not in envy, but let us put on the Lord Jesus Christ and let us make no provision for the flesh to fulfil its lusts. What have we just read? What have we just read? I'll tell you what we just read. This is the time... It's just before a new day. It, 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 there's a new day dawning. The sun is rising upon the horizon. The alarm bells are ringing to cause us to awaken from the slumber that we are in. It's time to be awoken to the reality that God's doing things in this world. That God is always working and it's time for us as Christians, to see that we are living in the reality of the arrival of Jesus Christ. To live in that reality. That's us. That's where we live. It's where our hearts and our minds need to be fixed. He's coming. Yes. You know, and again, not a cliche. Not a Christian song. No, no, no. He's literally coming. And, and, and we live on the very edge of that experience. And Paul says to believe, it's time to stir yourself from that lethargy, yeah. from that lack of enthusiasm. It's describing, actually, a state of, of unresponsiveness and inactivity. He's talking to believers, you see, who know Jesus and who believe that he is coming Yet their life and the choices they make bear no reflection of that truth. He's talking to believers whose lives reveal very little resemblance of the Lord they claim to follow. Jesus is coming, they cry, but their lives don't reflect it. The choices they make don't establish that as truth to the hearer. To them, he says this, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. What's he, what he's talking about is the night of the world's rebellion against its creator. That's human history. 
What are you talking about? The night of this world's rebellion against its creator, it's almost at an end. And there's a new day dawning. There's a day that is dawning upon the horizon when Christ will come for his church. When Christ will appear and the brightness of his appearing, the Bible says, will defeat the enemies of God. When Christ will usher in his kingdom. Look, I'm not here to to argue over eschatology and how we see these things unfold. No, I'm here to simply say that the day is at hand. He says, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armour of light. Christian. John tells us this. Let me, 1 John, chapter 1, and verse 5. He says this. This is the message which we heard from the beginning, and we declare it to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Remember, we have been called to put on the armour of light. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and we walk in darkness, we lie, and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You are a Christian. You're a believer in Jesus. You have been rescued from the darkness of sin and rebellion against the God that created you. Do you realize that? Of course you do. In fact, Colossians tells us in chapter 1 and verse 13, it says this, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his son, or so I should say the kingdom of the son of his love. You can read it this way. God has transformed us from sinners who were bound by sin, transformed us from that into create creations that are meant for heaven. Yes. Right? Let us be awoken to that reality. You've been created as a creature intended for heaven. Let us be awoken to that. Let us live like that. So Paul is saying. Let us live like that, not sleeping believers warming ourselves in the slumber under the blankets of the ways of this world. No, 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 no. Scripture says, no, let us walk properly as in the day. Not now what he's going to do. He's going to describe the characteristics of this world. So he says, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry. We've read it three times now. In revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. I read, I, I read an article this week, and it, the leading statement was this. We are witnessing the development and the acceptance of a new moral code. And then he went on, I won't read you the article, but he spoke about how the baby boomer generation, so we're back, in, we're back in the early 60s and on, right? How the baby boomer generation, when it grew up, it began to push against the boundaries that the generation before them gave them, against the morality that the generation before them gave. And the following generation pushed even further against that I'm not going to point fingers at anybody, but now what we are left with is a moral system that is based upon nothing more than convenience, feelings, and selfishness. That's the morality of this world. It's the morality of this world where biblical morality has been abandoned for individual relativism, where we decide ourselves what is right and what is wrong. And so right now, This is where we live, people. Right now, we have a society that is both ignorant and, quite frankly, is offended by the very thought that morality is determined not by us, but by the God who created us, and he holds us accountable to it. You can't say that to the people out there. Can't do that. Here's the thing. This new morality might not like it, But the Bible, well, our verse here says 
says it uses a word that this current morality generation hates. You know what it is? It says don't. Yes. It's telling us how to live. Yes. It's telling us what to do. He says don't walk in revelry and drunkenness. Don't walk in lewdness and lust. Don't walk in strife and envy. Romans 8 says this in chapter uh, verse 5. It's for those who live according to the flesh. When it says the flesh, it's talking about the sinful nature. Those who walk according to the flesh, the sinful nature, they set their minds on the things of the flesh, of the sinful nature. But those who live according to the spirit on the things of the spirit. He says, for to be carnally minded, carnally, that is sinful. To be sinfully minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal, that is the sinful mind, is enmity, which means is at war against God. You tell them that their morality. You tell them what true morality is, biblical morality is. And you'll understand how the unbelieving world is at war with God. But the carnal mind, the sinful mind, is enmity. It wars against God, but it is not subject to the laws of God, nor indeed can it be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And I've read these verses to bring you to the first half of verse 9. Okay? So verse 8 again. So those who war are in the flesh cannot please God, but you, you, you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit. Christian, when the scripture says it is high time to awake out of sleep, it means it's time to start to choose to walk in not in the flesh. Waking up means pursuing a life that is driven by the spirit of God who lives within the believer. That's what walking in the spirit is. That's what waking up is. Instead of slumbering, as described by the Apostle Paul, by giving into our old soulish natures, our old soulish desires. And so he talks about, again, revelry and drunkenness. That was a part of our old soulish desires. You know what revelry and drunkenness literally is? It's that whole party mentality that this world has given over to. Lewdness there. When he says lewdness, it's talking about sexual sin. Any sexual sin outside of the confines of marriage. He says lewdness and lust, which is, a, which is the idea of, again, it's sexually not restrained. It's doing, it's living, it's being however you want to be. And of course, strife and envy. You see, Romans 8, that passage that we read, continues. It says, therefore, brethren, we are dead as not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. In other words... We don't own the flesh anything. We don't. Even though your flesh is telling that you owe it everything. We don't owe it anything. When I came to Christ, well, let's forget that story. Because you know the same story. You look back at the demands that your flesh placed upon your life. And what it created, the strife that it created, the problems that it created, that's why you found yourself crawling out to God. And the war ended. And the Spirit of God born in your hearts began to fill you with new desire. Right? New desire. Therefore, brethren, we are dead as not to the flesh to live according to the Spirit. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Look, there may be a generation out there now that refuses to recognize and follow God's morality. In fact, they can't. That's what those verses tell us. They can't. But here's the thing. But for their sake, for their sake, for the debt of love that we owe, We can. We can. We can put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. We can live like that. We can clothe ourselves with Jesus Christ. We can. They can't. We can, not only for our sakes, but for their sakes, for the debt of love that we owe. What does that look like, putting on Jesus Christ? You say, well, it looks like Jesus Christ, don't you? And you would be right. 
Paul talks about it often. In Colossians chapter 3, let me, let me read it to you how he describes it. I'm going to bring this to an end. He describes it like this in verse 8 of chapter 3. But now you yourselves are to put off all of these. And here comes the list. This is what we put off. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language that comes out of your mouth. We put that off. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. And now having put that off, we put on, having put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him, that's the knowledge of Christ, where there is neither Jew nor Greek, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, scythian, nor slave nor free. Christ is all in all. So God has no partiality of persons, right? Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. We can do this. Put on tender mercies. Put on kindness. Put on humility. Put on meekness. Put on long-suffering. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also are to forgive. We must forgive. But above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. You see, what we all need to realise, at the end of everything that I've said here this morning, this list, what we put on, Christ has already placed it within you. You know that? He's placed it within you. That's, that's why Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16 confidently says, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfil the lust of the flesh. If we will seek Him, Christian, if we will follow Him, if we will choose to obey Him, these things will be evident within our lives and evident of the reality of who we actually belong to. That is Christ. And the truly glorious thing is, and we've got to get a hold of this, is that God's done this in us. This new man, he's done this. He has made it possible for us to live the very life that we have been called to live. It's done. It's finished. we just got to wake up. we just got to wake up, stand up, and follow him. Do you get that? Wake up, stand up, and follow him. Look, look, I love to sleep in on a Saturday morning. In fact, if I'm left alone, there will be no Saturday morning. You know? Donna loves to get up early and get on with the day and get things done. You know, and, and that sometimes causes problems. <laughs> but is that not what God is saying here? Let's wake up and realise yeah, God is working. And God is working in this very last moment. There's not much time. So we've got to get on with it. Stand up and follow him. And we will find this, that wherever our paths lead us, whoever we meet along in the path of life that God has put us upon, the very depth of God's life-transforming love will be paid into those lives. And here's the glorious thing. Some of them will believe. Some of them will believe and they will gloriously incur that same debt that you and I have. And they will take it to the next. That's the kingdom of God. It's how it grows. The hour is late, my friend. Jesus is coming. Amen? Amen? I'm going to invite the guys up. And as they come up... Let's gather around the communion table. But we know that these emblems represent the body of Christ that was lifted up for us, crucified for us, We know that this cup represents the blood that was shed for us, that we might be forgiven of our sin. 
And we're told to do this in remembrance of him as often as we do it. But I want to remind you something. As Jesus died for us, shed his blood for us, as Isaiah says, our sin was red as scarlet, but we have been made white as snow. And he was laid in a tomb. And on the third day, it's interesting, I love the, I love the picture, because on the third day, we're told that the women, and the Bible takes the time to say, they went early. They went early in the morning to the tomb. Yeah. They got up early to be about the business of God in these last days. They got up early, they went to the tomb. Jesus was risen. He appeared to Mary Magdalene. He appeared to the women on the way back as they were running back to the disciples. He appeared to Peter somewhere on the road. He appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus. He appeared to the the disciples in the upper room that night. He appeared to 500 people at once at one gathering. He appeared to the disciples on the shores of the Galilee. He appeared, he appeared, he appeared. And every single time, he was instilling within them the very purpose for their being. They've got a message to take to this world. And what is it? Well, it's captured nowhere greater than in the life of Peter. Do you love me, Peter? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. And they did, didn't they? And for 2,000 years now, believers have gone face to face with people. Forget about the internet. Forget about you know, mass communication. The gospel has grown, has grown when people woke up and went to someone else whose path was determined by God and told them who Jesus was of his great love and poured themselves into that person and the kingdom grew. That's all that Paul is saying. That's all he's saying here. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we hold these emblems in our hands. And we know that this bread represents the very bread of life that Jesus is to us. That he gives us life, life eternal through his sacrifice. And that this cup represents the very blood of Christ that washes us clean, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We look upon these emblems, Lord, and we're reminded of the depth of the love that you have for us. We're reminded of the incredible value that you have placed upon our eternal souls. I pray that this truth, Lord, would stir our hearts to reach out in love to those that you would lead us to to see them with your eyes, that they might experience us as we have experienced you. Father, build your church. We thank you for the body. Let's take it together. And for the precious blood that was shed to cleanse us, we thank you, Father.